Come, Holy Spirit, come. May the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So once again, I, I, I screwed up. I make the preaching schedule, and I didn't look far enough into the lessons to realize that I failed to stick Father Lee with today's gospel. <laughs> of all the lessons in the three-year lectionary cycle if there's one you want to not have to preach on, it's this one. Carl knows, yeah. Harry knows. You know that, right? Because it sounds like God is praising dishonesty. What do you do with that? It's just, it's hard. Part of the problem, of course, is we're hearing it 2,000 years later. We're hearing it as part of a culture that is different than it was then. And we're not, we're not the disciples who he's telling this to or the Pharisees who are listening along. We're, we're something else. But his parable is always there for those who are of God to encourage, to instruct, to uplift, and to just absolutely smack those who would oppose Christ's kingdom coming into this world upside the head. If we'd read the next verse, we would have heard the Pharisees sneered at him because they were working on the system of the day. Here's how that works. If I have more money than you, God likes me better than he likes you. That was the system. God blesses those whom he favors, and the rest of you, well, and God forbid you should be born blind or with an infirmity or whatever, who sinned? This man, his parents, who, where's the sin that has resulted in this deformity, this problem, this weakness? The idea that somehow what we do controls what God does back to us misses the point of God being God. The only time that we really control what God's going to do is when we walk in His ways, when we follow what He's telling us to do. And so Jesus is trying to mess with people's heads a little bit and trying to get them to understand there are two things in this world to choose from. Now, I am not a binary person. I'm not, I always think there's three or four or five or six or seven or eight good answers and 10 or 12 bad ones. You know, any, any problem, any proposition that is made has multiple answers. But when it comes down to whom you are serving, Jesus is very clear. You're either serving God or you're serving this world. And the praise comes from those who don't care a rip about God but are living only for this world. How shrewd they are. How smart they are at being able to leverage friends, favors, money in any kind of different way. And he is even suggesting, whoa, that you were that smart about the things that are in heaven.
And truth be told, as hard as we try in our hearts and in our minds to say, okay, we're only going to serve God. I'm only going to seek things that are heavenly. I'm only going to, I, we get pulled back to this idea that somehow what we do results in a blessing or a curse. Somehow what we do is good news or bad news. Yesterday, we had the burial office for Thomas, 54 years old. People are still coming up to me saying, why? Why did this happen? I hear from a lot of people who are uneasy with the idea of confessing their sins or facing their inner demons or whatever. That same kind of measuring. Well, yeah, I know I'm a sinner, but at least I'm not as bad as that one. And I wasn't pointing at anybody in particular. Sorry, Carl. Um, you know, uh, at least I'm not as bad as that one. I'll probably get to heaven. I'm basically a good person. That's what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about understanding the difference between this world, which grades on a curve, and heaven, which is pass fail. And guess what? We have all failed. Heaven is a perfect place, and unless you're perfect, not seeing any hands, you can't earn your way in. Have to accept that. You have to quit comparing yourself to others and say, okay, I need to get into heaven. The only way I can do that is to boldly confess my sins unto Almighty God and receive the forgiveness that is offered to me on the cross. That's it. That's the whole deal. All right, back to the parable. Because Jesus, while, yes, our eternal destination is important to him, he wants us to understand what we should be doing in the meantime. In the meantime, it's okay if you have money. It's okay if you have wealth. It's okay for all these things, but how are you using them? Jesus recently had just talked about the man who built the big barns. He wanted to hoard all his stuff. He wanted to protect all his stuff. And that day, he was to die. Hoarding stuff, being focused on this world. Isn't what it's about. We're born, we die, and then we have eternity. Why are we so worried about this little piece? He says, don't worry about that piece. Use what you have to further God's kingdom. Take what you have, your position, your power, your wealth. My favorite story in the Bible is that of Queen Esther, who used her power, her privilege, and her wealth to save the entire Hebrew people. God doesn't mind if you have stuff. God doesn't mind if you enjoy it. But is it the accumulation and hoarding of that that is your focus? Or is it about using it to begin to help to bring God's kingdom here on earth? Make friends using that so that when you pass from this life to the next, there's somebody there to greet you. Make friends. 
welcome others into the kingdom. Use what you have to be a blessing. Because you can't serve this world and God at the same time. Amen.